Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Commanding General, Education Command, and President, Marine Corps University, Brigadier General Walker Field. Please, everybody sit down. <clears throat> Take your seats. Good afternoon and welcome to Marine Corps University. It's certainly a pleasure to have all of us, all of you here today who are in person, which is largely Command and Staff College of Marine Corps University, and those who have dialed in uh, in our virtual audience. It's certainly a pleasure for the Marine Corps University to partner with the Norwegian Defense University College and present today's Arctic Symposium. I have the privilege of introducing our guest panel. I'm gonna ease around here to the right so that I can see them and work my way from the far end or my left coming back in this direction. I'm gonna start with Brigadier General Doug Clark. Doug, show us your hand, please. Let's make sure we see who you are. Deputy Commander of, of the Joint War, NATO Joint Warfighting Center. It's good to see you again, Doug. Continuing in this direction from my left, Major General Lervik, the Chief of the Norwegian Army. Sir, it's great to see you. Thanks for being with us. Yes, absolutely. And that was a fantastic session this morning for all of you. Uh, continuing on in the center, uh, the former Secretary of the Navy, 77th Secretary of the Navy, the Honorable Kenneth Braithwaite, and former Ambassador from the U.S. to Norway. Sir, thank you for being with us. It's great to have you here. Yes, sir, it's good to have you back on campus. And then, uh, Madam Ambassador, the Am Ambassador from Norway to the United States, Ms. Anakin Kutnis, thank you so much for being here with us. It's, it's certainly a privilege for us to have you and love the rich discussion this morning, so thank you, ma'am. Continuing all the way around to the far end, Dr. Lon Strauss. Dr. Strauss, it's great to see you. Thank you so much. It's great to have you here. Uh, in the outstations, do we have comms with the outstations? I'm looking at my team. Brigadier General Tony Henderson, Anthony Henderson, can you hear me? I take, I take that as no. If you can and your comms are, are not on, welcome to Tony Henderson. He's the CG of 2nd MEB, Deputy Commander of 2MEF down at Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. He was on with us this morning. He will be dialing in. It's certainly a pleasure to have Tony with us, uh, and, and I look forward to hearing from him and wish he was here in person. How about Dan Whitnam? I saw you earlier. Are you in the room? No, we'll keep an eye out for Dan Whitnam. Colonel Dan Whitman uh, runs our Mountain Warfare Training Center. Consider him to be the most proficient cold weather trainer within the Marine Corps today. And anytime we have him in our presence, it's truly a pleasure. So welcome to Dan as well. To everyone else who's here, it's our pleasure to have with us great scholars and practitioners of the Marine Corps, the Navy, the U.S. Army, our Coast Guard, Canada, Australia, UK, Sweden, Denmark, and Norway will participate throughout this symposium. Thank you all for being with us and joining us for this two-day event. So a little bit of purpose, so what, what are we doing and why? MCU, Marine Corps University, and the Norwegian Defense University College are conducting this joint Arctic symposium to focus on strategic competition, great power competition, and to expand our understanding here at MCU, mostly for the benefit of Command and Staff College who's here in person, and more broadly to the Marine Corps, the general security and military challenges in the Arctic region. Clearly, the Arctic is a region of change and strategic importance for the U.S., so we're looking forward to rich discussions during the symposium. But as it pertains to the Marine Corps and our Norwegian uh, uh, partners, let's go back and give you a little context for how long we've been working together. Back in 1964 was the first uh, exercise in, in Norway, I believe then it was called Northern Express. The name has changed a number of times. I, partici I personally participated in 1999 and 2001 in what was called Battle Griffin, still one of the highlight training exercises in all of my career, and I believe it's cold resolved this year. We'll see that happen in April of 22. Specific, though, to the university, we've had Norwegian officers attending the Expeditionary Warfare School, which is our captain's course since way back in 1960. Command and Staff College, we've had representatives here since 1967, and we've had a permanent member of Command and Staff College staff since 1996. So it's certainly a relationship that we covet and very much appreciate. So in closing, we look forward to this symposium building and strengthening our relationships as allies and understanding our security challenges in the Arctic. So thank you very much again for joining us. And to those in the audience, when you have an opportunity to ask questions, please take the opportunity you have with this rich panel to ask questions and further explore the challenges of security in the Arctic environment. So thank you very much. Please.
Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the deputy of the Norwegian Defense Command and Staff College, Captain Steiner Torset. Thank you, and uh, good afternoon to, uh, to everybody. Um, first, let me uh, pass on a greeting from uh, Major General Fransen, the commander of the National Defense University College. Um, he couldn't be here uh, for this opening and participate in the symposium, and it can have something to do with him uh, starting in his new job in the Ministry of Defense a couple of hours from now. He's starting tomorrow morning, Norwegian time. Um, this symposium, as we've already heard, is a very good example of the important transatlantic link between the US and Norway. Uh, it is definitely an arena where academics and officers meet. Uh, it is an arena where research and experience come together. Uh, that will definitely serve uh, in good discussions and yeah, you know, share knowledge to decision makers. Um, and this is important for future planning on both sides of the Atlantic. Uh, putting the Arctic on the agenda is important. And the Arctic theater is in competition with other areas of the world. We all know that. And uh, areas of interest. But it is an area where all, which also has its own specifics and own challenges. It is highly appreciated, therefore, uh, that our two institutions can facilitate for a symposium like this. Having Arctic security on the agenda creates an opportunity to develop and maintain important knowledge about the theater and region with specific challenges. In addition to this symposium, uh, we are also working to explore possibilities for student exchange between our institutions, as well as uh, exchange of scholars, uh, all as a part of an ambition to further develop the, the relationships between the US and Norway. But for now, I'm looking forward to the keynotes, the panels, and the discussions, both today and tomorrow. Thank you. The moderators for today's panel are Dr. Lon Strauss and Dr. Nord Veggie, gentlemen. Oh, there we go. Okay. Uh, so uh, before we begin, uh, let me give uh, the obligatory uh, disclaimer. Uh, and uh, thank you, uh, sirs, for the, uh, for the opening remarks. Uh, thank you to uh, the CSC student body for being here, even though you were told to be here. We definitely appreciate you being here. Uh, and definitely thank you and welcome to uh, our online audience uh, for also being here. Um, I have to uh, remind everyone that all opinions that are expressed here are those of the individual uh, and do not necessarily reflect, reflect the views of the Marine Corps University, uh, Norwegian Defense University College, uh, or any other agency of the United States or Norwegian governments. Uh, we will be recording uh, this panel, um, and it will be live streamed uh, over the internet. Uh, however, we will cut off the uh, recording once we start the Q&A session to hopefully have more free uh, Q&A uh, up here on the stage and with all of you on the stage. Those are, that are on WebEx, uh, you can still put in comments, and uh, we will try to insert those comments and questions into the Q&A session. Uh, but before we get to Q&A, we will go through all of the panelists uh, and their prepared remarks uh, before we do that, just so that we understand how the flow will go. Uh, and with that. Yeah. So um, we have already introduced the panel, so I don't want to repeat that. But I'll just want to say that <clears throat> we, we had a really interesting morning session that you might uh, listen into later as a podcast. Um, we also have tried to divide uh, the topics a little bit, so uh, we'll start out with uh, a little bit more political overview where we have the title Arctic Policy and Strategy in the Great Power Competition with uh, Ambassador Anakin Krutnes and uh, former Ambassador to Norway and Secretary of the Navy, Kenneth Braithwaite. And after that, we'll go straight into the military power dimension of the Arctic 
uh, with the two generals, and uh, we think we can have them uh, uh, in succession and just uh, uh, wait with the Q and answer ses session to, to the end when everyone has presented. And without um, any further ado, uh, please, Anna King Krutas, uh, you're supposed to start with your presentation. Thank you. Um, I saw my presentation just a second ago, but it seemed to be lost. There it is. Um, thank you. Um, and thank you uh, for being here. Um, it's so good to have a real audience again. So I, I actually had to take a picture of you because <laughs> it's, a, it's a wonderful sight here from the scene. Um, I, will, I will start by, by kind of the big picture, uh, setting the stage. Where is the Arctic? What is the Arctic? What are we actually talking about here? So what is the Arctic? And if you put on the first slide, uh, this is probably something a lot of you associate with the Arctic. It is um, lost, it is um, isolated, and there's a lot of ice. Uh, yeah. Um, and that is the Arctic, and I have some wonderful experiences with that Arctic. But next slide is also Arctic, and that is Tromsø, uh, well north of the Arctic Circle, a city in Norway, uh, where we actually have 5G and buses and uh, universities and restaurants and bars and nightlife and you name it. It's a wonderful place to be. And my point is that people live in the Arctic. Actually, 10% uh, of Norwegians live in the Arctic. Uh, so that is just a point I wanted to make. And, and the huge difference um, here is that we have the Gulf Stream. So we have ice-free waters. We have a warmer climate at this latitude than you would have in Alaska. Uh, so Arctic is vast, huge, diversified. There's not one Arctic. Norway sees the Arctic as um, a peaceful region. There is some tension, I'll come back to that, but, but it is peaceful, it's stable, and it's prosperous. It has a lot of resources. So what can we do to continue to have a stable, peaceful, prosperous Arctic? Um, well, one of the challenges, and that's the next slide, is of course that the Arctic is changing. And um, this is um, the um, uh, difference for 40 years um, on the ice. Uh, you see how much uh, the ice has melted in the Arctic Ocean. Uh, and that uh, is a challenge for many reasons. And the climate change and, and the heating of, of the planet is, of course, a challenge both to human beings and, and, and to um, every living being on, on the planet. Uh, and we see that in so many different aspects. And we see, um, we see floodings, we see uh, fires. I don't have to talk to you about climate change, and, and that's not the subject today, but this is a major challenge in the Arctic. But what it also <coughs> uh, causes is, of course, an opening up of the ocean, the Arctic Ocean. Uh, that gives access to new resources and it opens up new sea lanes. And um, one, of, um, one of the, um, uh, can I have the next slide on to see what that is? Yeah, and the next one again? Okay, so um, there are three basic pillars we say to keep the Arctic stable and prosperous. And those three is that we need to respect international law, we need to have international cooperation, and we need to manage the resources in a responsible way. When it comes to international law, um, the Arctic is governed by the law of the sea, because the Arctic is an ocean, the Arctic Ocean. And the, the law of the sea convention governs that and it says exactly who owns the resources, who owns the fish, who owns the minerals on the sea bottom, who owns the gas and oil. That is actually regulated. So there's no race towards the resources in the Arctic. This is regulated. So as long as everyone respects that international law, we're fine. And so far, all the Arctic countries have respected that. So we're good so far. 
The second one is the international cooperation. And this picture shows the Arctic Council. So that is um, an organization for the eight Arctic countries and uh, for six indigenous peoples uh, organizations. So this is where the indigenous people uh, have their say. Uh, and this is a fantastic organization that can discuss everything that goes on in the Arctic, except security policy. And so the third uh, one, and we can put the next slide on, that I mentioned, is we have to manage the resources. So you see this fish boat, uh, and you see um, there are some windmills behind it. Um, so um, we, in Norway, see that we are in a green transition. We are still oil and gas producing country, and we will continue to produce oil and gas also in the Arctic. Uh, we produce it in um, the cleanest possible way. We don't do flaring, we don't have any methane emissions. We are actually trying to electrify the production process, so we will use wind power to give the energy to extract oil and gas some places. So we're trying to move in a green transition. We're also um, inventing new and creative industries in the Arctic because we need an economic development in the Arctic. We want people to be able to live in the Arctic. Um, so, so just that is the, the pillars of the Norwegian thinking of how to have a prosperous Arctic. Respect for international law, international cooperation, and then economic sustainable development. Then um, just a new slide to show you, but you know this, uh, the new sea lanes. They are not yet opened as to commercial traffic. Uh, some try, uh, but, but it's not a commercial feasible route yet. Um, there's too much ice. Um, there is no uh, well built out uh, search and rescue capacity. Um, and the Russians also are uh, putting a lot of restrictions on traffic uh, through the Northern Sea Road. There is a lot of traffic there, but it goes from one point and out to either side. There's very little that goes in transit all through it. Then I wanted, um, next slide, uh, to spend just a few minutes on um, this, uh, which is um, the cooperation between Norway and US. And, and this is actually an F-35, uh, two Norwegian F-35s and, and um, an American B-1 uh, Lancer jet. And, and uh, this is just a picture of the very close cooperation we have. Um, Norway is neighbor to Russia. So uh, thinking security policy is not new to us. And we've had um, uh, a relationship to Russia for thousands of years, but, and it has been a peaceful one. We have never been to war with Russia. And one of the reasons uh, is that we um, have this alliance um, with you. Um, we are a founding member of NATO. And uh, being that, and your presence being known, is a strong deterrence. So, and we always have to balance this deterrence with some reassurance. We don't want to provoke the Russians unnecessarily. So we always strive to find the right balance between deterrence and reassurance. And, and I know my colleague here will talk more about that. Um, we have seen negative developments in Russia lately. Um, their relationship to the West um, have deteriorated. And we've also seen increased authoritarianism, authoritarianism uh, in Russia and, and a very assertive and anti-Western uh, posture. Um, we, of course, stand with the EU and with the US when it comes to uh, condemning the Russian annexation of Crimea and their um, aggression in Eastern Ukraine. 
At the same time, Russia is our neighbor, so, so we have to deal with them, and, and we have to have some kind of cooperation with them. So um, as neighbors, we work together on um, search and rescue. We work together on environmental questions. We have just started a cooperation on cleaning up plastic pollution in the ocean. We work together on um, cleaning up nuclear waste. That is their nuclear waste. We don't have any nuclear, uh, but it's so close to a border that we're uncomfortable with that waste being there. So we have engaged with the Russians to clean it up. Uh, we manage fish stocks together. So we have this daily, day-to-day -day, um, cooperation with the Russians. And we have a dialogue with them. Um, both on political level and, as general, will uh, be able to explain on a military level, but very little compared to what we had before uh, 2014. Um, the last thing I, I will say is that um, this photo also illustrates how we, um, being where we are, being located where we are, um, at the border with Russia, we see ourselves as NATO's airs and eyes in the north. We keep an eye on what's going on there. Um, and we have traditionally done that um, to see what the Russians are up to. But of course, we will also keep an eye on what others are up to. And, and, and um, being in the US, I know there's um, a lot of uh, focus on the Chinese. And of course, we will follow the Chinese activity in, in our Arctic very closely. So thank you. For an introduction, I, I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Ambassador. Uh, uh, if, if we can turn it over uh, to you, Mr. Secretary. It was a bright August Arctic day as the elderly statesman made his way up to the stage. And in his remarks, he was the most senior American government official to be in the far environs of a new portion of the American territory. And he said, and I quote, you the citizens of Sitka are the pioneers, the advanced guard of the future of Alaska. You naturally ask when, from where and how soon reinforcements shall arrive. And what are the guarantees that they are coming? This question has been asked by the pioneers of every state and territory of our American Union. And history furnishes the complete, conclusive, and satisfactory answer. They come in obedience to the great natural law that obliges needy men to seek subsistence and invites adventurous men to seek fortune where it can be obtained. The guarantees and signs of their coming to Alaska are to be found in the resources of this vast territory, the resources of Alaska. William Howard Seward was the Secretary of State in 1869 when he ventured to Alaska to visit it. Two years earlier, he had purchased it from Russia, Tsarist Russia, for the grand total of 7.2 million US dollars. We may think in 2021 that $7 million in 1867 was a lot of money. That was about $133 million in today's funds. So what the New York Times referred to as Seward's folly really underscored the vision of this man for what Alaska would mean to America in the future. Not only did he know that it brought vast new natural resources, but he said it was the key to global trade in a network that was yet to come. 21% of today's undiscovered oil reserves reside in the Arctic. 
28% natural gas. 1.5 to 2 trillion US dollars in rare earth minerals are to be found in that portion of the Arctic only above Alaska, let alone in Canada. Russia derives over 20% of their GDP from the Arctic. Yet, we are here today because the Arctic has emerged into the limelight of the world, not because of its significance economically or even from national security, but because of climate change. I've seen climate change with my own eyes. I was a young naval aviator flying missions in Alaska from Naval Air Station ADAC back in the late 1980s. And most recently was the US ambassador to the Kingdom of Norway, where I made many trips to the high north. And the Sami people showed me the signs of global warming. That is why when I was asked to become the Secretary of the Navy, I commissioned a new Arctic strategy, a blue Arctic, along with my colleague, Dr. Walter Burbick, who's here from the Naval War College. What we put into that document, we would hope, would pull a reluctant America, a reluctant Department of Defense, into a space of awareness. If we were to walk out in the streets of the Capitol in Washington today, we might find a few more Americans who would understand the significance of what it is to be an Arctic nation. But the majority of Americans from sea to shining sea have no idea that America is one of eight Arctic nations. As another visionary, General Billy Mitchell, who, when he testified before the Senate, talked about the importance of Alaska to national security. He said, and I quote, Alaska is the most strategic place on Earth, critical to not only our economy, but more importantly, our national security. And that is why, ladies and gentlemen, in the last decade, Russia and China have both pivoted to the Arctic. Just last month, President Vladimir Putin celebrated his 69th birthday. And in that celebration, he talked about a renewed military capability for the Russians in the high north. And he said that that was important to the future of what Russia and their national security. So like a reluctant nation, I found in the Department of Defense a reluctancy to grasp our responsibility to step forward and to be a leader in the high north. To be a leader means we need to deter those who have a different vision for the high north. What I learned during my time in Norway was that the Norwegians see this area as a peaceful place that all nations should have access to. With renewed great power competition, we have the ability to stand with them to ensure, as the leader we are, that this peace is maintained. I don't have to tell you, you who wear the cloth of our nation, that to train, and to train with the best, is important. That's why I accepted this invitation to be on this dais with those from Norway who represent both the civil diplomatic and the military part of that great relationship. And I've had many discussions with Commandant Neller and Commandant Berger about the importance of a continuing U.S. Marine Corps presence in the high north. Just this month, Proceedings Magazine had an article written by a very um, well-informed, bright, young Marine Corps captain about pivoting our training in the Arctic to Alaska into an old stomping ground of mine in the Aleutian chain ADAC. And I would argue that although we probably should exercise more in that part of the Arctic, what we have in our relationship with Norway is key to the future security of not only Norway, NATO, but the United States. And that's the ability to train alongside, arguably, the greatest Nordic warriors that the world has ever produced. 
but it also goes back to the understanding that to train and to be prepared to fight also comes with the recognition of the actual geography from which you may have to defend. And then there's also the deterrent signal that a continuous Marine Corps presence demonstrates each and every day when our boots are on their ground and we stand alongside them to protect freedom in the Arctic. So we have a responsibility and we have to understand what that responsibility means and to be aware that we are an Arctic nation and that we should train to be proficient in the Arctic as we do in every other theater of operation. Thank you, Doc. Thank you. Uh, Major Lurick, Major General Lurick. Thank you very much. <laughs> um, it's always a pleasure to talk to, especially uh, answer questions and discuss with the future leaders of our members. I'm really looking forward to the Q&A session. Uh, I will focus on the military aspects uh, and address what I think are the most important things that we, the Norwegian US team, must take into consideration and master in order to succeed in the Arctic. Next slide. Please. The operational environment has already been described by the ambassador. The Arctic is unique in its natural vitality and complexity as an operational environment. From this map, you can see there are, is a large maritime component, partly covered by the receding ice line. The receding ice line will increasingly open new sea routes and opportunities for competition. The seabed entails large oil and gas reserves, as already mentioned, in addition to other vast natural resources like fish. Next slide. Norway, above the Arctic Circle, you see there is about one quarter of Norway. Uh, it, the terrain is mountainous in the southwestern parts and in, with open large plateaus towards east, towards the Russian border. There are very few landlines of communication, which means that the numerous airports and harbors you can see as red and blue dots on the map are crucial to the population, but also crucial to any military operations. The weather in my area can be everything from clear sunshine 24 hours a day during um, summer to blinding snow blizzards combined with hurricane winds and freezing temperatures during the winter. The weather is temporal and sudden changes is normal. The season dictates to a large degree the amount of maneuverability, as an example, where the wet seasons during the summer impedes movement to a large degree, while the frozen winter periods allows for um, substantial use of track vehicles, up to and including main battle tanks in many areas. And just to give you the cold weather operation bluff, cold weather operation is a collective skill. It doesn't help to deploy in to, to do cold weather operations with a few very well, well trained specialists. Your soldiers, your marines will start losing fingers and toes within hours if your unit isn't trained. Military operation must be adjusted to the lay of the land and the weather. That's nothing specific about the Arctic. But in the Arctic, if you are successful, it will be a great ally. And if you fail, you do not need any enemies. Next slide. Looking at our neighbor, Russia. The Arctic is considered very important by Russia for many other reasons already mentioned. This is illustrated by the fact that a few years ago, a Russian deputy prime minister stated that the Arctic is Russia's mecca. It is therefore no surprise that the Russian military in the Arctic has gone through a major modernization and upgrade, including establishment of new and reopening of old military bases, as you can see on the map. 
We have also seen the establishment of new units, like a new mechanized infantry brigade as a part of the land forces on the Kola Peninsula, next to Norway and Finland. And we have also seen that the Northern Fleet has been upgraded to a military district status on the same level as the other four Russian military districts. Next slide. A wide range of new military equipment has been introduced also to Russian forces in the Arctic. Examples are <coughs> new, very capable boat and roll submarines, several long range precision missile systems, modern air defense systems, and modernized and winterized main battle tanks. Testing of new systems is ongoing, and we must expect that the Russian development in areas like air defense, long-range precision missiles, and unmanned systems will continue. And my assessment is that that will result in a force that is definitely near air. We have also seen numerous demonstrations of Russia's ability to move forces to the Arctic in a quick manner. That includes, of course, naval and air assets, but also movement by air and rail, by land units like their elite VDB air mobile units, regular army battalions, and strategic assets like their Iskander ballistic missile system, which you can see on the slide. We have also seen a significant increase in activity over the last few years, with units belonging to the Northern Fleet participating in Russia's military operations in Syria and the Ukraine. The training in the Arctic, in all domains, has increased both in size and complexity, demonstrating a Russian joint combined arms capability on a level that was definitely not there just a few years ago. So what are the lessons that I, based on my, especially the last three or four years, where I've worked very, very closely with the US Marines, including having the honor of having a US Marine Corps battalion for all general purposes, or for all purposes, attached to my brigade for two years. Um, next slide, please. First of all, the Marine. Tough, learns quickly, and adjusts well. The most important new disciplines we need, we, we try to learn to the Marine as they come in to do their, especially during their initial winter training, is that it's actually okay to complain that your feet are cold <laughs> to your body or your shoulder. That you have probably save your feet. We are also impressed by how you have managed to learn from each other. I'm really impressed how the different battalions rotating through Norway have been able to relay lessons and do adjustments between uh, each rotation. Also, areas like your joint fire competencies and capacities have been very, very important for our efforts to try and develop similar capabilities. Most importantly, I think the willingness from both the Norwegian Army and the US Marine Corps to commit to working together to build both trust and military capacity in a very effective manner. My assessment is that, as of today, the Norwegian US Marine Corps combined team, which we have created through living together, training together, and planning together, is the most efficient multinational team I have experienced in my 30 years in the military. Looking towards the future, and especially um, considering the US Marine Corps force development, we in the Norwegian Army consider ourselves to be an inside force, or to use the US Marine Corps uh, terminology, a standing force. Key deductions for us from that is that we must be present every day, all year, in the most important areas. We also recognize that the morning times have been significantly reduced, and therefore must increase both our readiness and combat power. That is why we, within the next five to six years, will triple the investments in new equipment, buying new main battle tanks, new uh, modern air defense systems, long range fires, and a wide range of other military capabilities. We are also in the process, or just started, 
the process of increasing our overall planning with about 50%, um, which will be taking about 10 years. And we're also standing up and have stood up a couple of new battalions that will continue to stand up new units in the near future. The modernization and growth of the Norwegian Army, combined with the US Marine Corps force development, presents several opportunities. First of all, I think we need to look into how we best can combine our resources. Not necessarily by copying each other in all aspects, but in a manner that presents an opponent with multiple dilemmas and at the same time give ourselves freedom of action. I'm confident that we can achieve a lot by combining the Norwegian Army's heavy mechanized formations and ranger type capacities with the US Marine Corps EA EABO concepts. In some areas, like for unmanned systems and long range fires, I think there is a potential to look into introducing similar or even identical systems. And furthermore, there are opportunities in how we test and develop the future work. We can offer US Marine Corps the opportunity to test and qualify your future equipment and concepts in what I think is the best and toughest training environment in the world. And finally, in the situation with continuous competition, training and exercising Marines and Norwegian Army soldiers to master the harsh Arctic conditions is important in itself. But it's also important messaging in the continuous dialogue and competition between the different actors on the international stage. And to, to conclude, what are the most important elements for us to fight and operate in the Arctic? First of all, it's to be able to work as a team. Often I'm being told that the most important thing we do then is to make sure that we have interoperable C2 systems. But I will argue that that is not the case, though it is important. The most important thing is trust. Trust between soldiers and marines, senior NCOs and commanders. And this trust is best established by working together before a crisis occurs. Like what we're doing here today, and by training and exercising together, which we will do this winter, and against, uh, against each other, which we will also be doing this winter. Trust is also being built by honest discussions of our own respective shortfalls, and by sharing intelligence and situation understanding on a regular basis. Secondly, I think it is important that we recognize that the Arctic is different and act accordingly. To fight and win in the Arctic, we must recognize that we first of all must master the conditions, weather, climate, terrain. This requires training of units, not only specialists, as fighting in the Arctic is a collective skill. And my last point, we should aim to develop capabilities that are supplementary and to present the opponent numerous dilemmas while ensuring that we are capable of fighting as one combined team. Thank you very much. Thank you, General. Um, Is this thing on? Can you guys hear me? Mic uh, fit? No. All right. Uh, so while General Henderson's communicators bend and thrust and do push-ups until their arms fall off, I'll, uh, I'll share a few thoughts. Before I say anything, thanks for the opportunity to the field and to the whole staff uh, for the opportunity to, to be here. Um, and, uh, and I will apologize up front for being out of uniform. I did push-ups before we came out on the stage for being out of uniform. The general and I just came in from, uh, from Europe. He came through Copenhagen, and I came through Amsterdam. And the dog ate my homework, and uh, they ate my baggage. So, um, so this is what you got to deal with. <laughs> I do want to say congratulations. Congratulations for being here. Uh, when you think about ILS, intermediate level school, and how important it is to educate our soldier sailors and our Marines, you made the cut, and you're here. Take full advantage of this opportunity, because as you study warfare, you study the history of warfare, you'll find out two words. Personalities matter. 
And so the relationships that you're establishing here over this, the, the duration of this year, invaluable, because you're going to work together. And I would say put specific emphasis on your international personnel over here, and especially whole of government. And I pray that you have whole of government personnel, especially people from the State Department, the future ambassadors of the world that are here. Make sure that they are really pulling a lot of the weight in your, uh, in your breakout groups and your seminars because their input is invaluable. Most of you know how Marines think. You need to know how they think. It will make you a better officer, no question. So congratulations. Virtual presence is in fact actual absence. The statement means that only by having an actual presence in a location in critical areas can the United States, um, and assisting it in its allies, can deter our adversaries. So alongside McPhippen, of course everyone here is familiar with the Marine Corps preposition, uh, preposition program Norway and the Marine Rotational Force Europe, Murphy, as the general was just referring to, our dynamic president in the Norwegian High North is facilitating credible deterrence and reassurance to our NATO allies in the Arctic. It was very reassuring. It's great to hear the input, the input from, uh, from the Secretary because so many times when we talk about the Arctic, especially as Marines, we only talk about Norway and we forget about Alaska, Canada, Russia. There's a lot more than just the high north of Norway and the interface with Russia in that location when we talk about the Arctic. But the physical presence of McPhippen and Murphy in Norway represents an essential demonstration of partnership and cooperation where competition is heating up between great powers, China, Russia, and NATO allies in an increasingly important and fractured blueing Arctic, an ocean previously frozen white but becoming navigable. The United States Marine Corps continued presence in the blueing Arctic is setting the conditions for the joint force as well as partner and allied Arctic nations to maintain a secure operating environment open for economic competition throughout an unprecedented scenario influenced by the changing climate. So it was not on. Okay. <laughs> All right. I hear you though, General. You're doing a good job. Good. <laughs> let, me, let me ask you this question. Can you guys in the back here? You got me? Don't waste uh, technology. I think, we're, I think we need Oh, wait, we've got people online. Yeah. OK. I was testing you. I need to keep this thing on, Marines. Let's go. All right. A blue Arctic, a catalyst of a revised global order. The important geopolitical opportunities brought about by the blueing Arctic cannot be understated. 88% of the world's trade takes place between Europe, Asia, and North America. A blueing Arctic has the ability to connect Europe and Asia, 75% of the world's population. And that is via a northern passage, despite the Arctic Ocean being the world's smallest ocean. This northern passage has the potential to cut ocean-going transit times and costs by 40%, dramatically lowering transportation costs and ultimately lowering the cost of goods for consumers, especially in Europe and Asia. Moreover, the Arctic possesses trillions of dollars of exploitable wealth we've already talked about. These facts, combined with exploitable interpretations of control over ice-covered areas within the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, UNCLOSE, as the ambassador refer referenced before, have a potential to create a geopolitical environment ripe with tension and potential flashpoints. Indeed, UNCLOSE stimulated dangerous change by asking states to file their claims to economic exclusions, something Russia has already done. In contrast, the United States, not a signatory of UNCLOS has not filed claims. What all this amounts to is that territorial disputes between states in the Arctic could rise to a level in the world on a scale not seen since the colonial era land grabs by empire building states. This effect will likely create ever greater competition and if mismanaged, potential flashpoints could lead to open conflict. The blueing Arctic will have other consequences beyond the geographic scope of the Arctic itself as well. As Arctic ice melts, and it is melting, rising global sea levels will be a catalyst for the displacement of swaths of society around the world's most populated areas, transforming entire ecosystems while creating new littoral environments. These changes will precipitate extensive exploitative opportunities amidst a significant global upheaval by authoritarian actors unsatisfied with the post-World War II international order, like China and Russia, to consolidate their power and, and control over resources. Indeed, 
Russia and China, they too have deep strategic security interests in the Blueing Arctic, driven by resource competition and geostrategic goals. The Arctic has an enormous amount of hydrocarbons and other minerals in the ocean. And according to the geological survey, U.S. Geological Survey in 2006, 13% of untapped oil, 30% untapped natural gas, resources that the Secretary You, this is me, a just fire. Got me. Okay. On top of the other mineral deposits de desired for exploitative purposes, these resources are likely to be a significant source of competition in the coming decades, where territorial rights will have a significant role to play. As the largest nation bordering the Arctic Ocean, and as a key competitor of the United States, it's important to understand Russian geopolitical interests in the Blueing Arctic. With NATO on their western flank and as a traditional European-based power, Russia orients the, orient, orients the overwhelming majority of their forces to their western borders. As a matter of fact, in northern Norway, the statement is, everyone faces east, meaning NATO is faced east facing Russia, Russia is facing east facing their population. So on top, of the, uh, on, on top of those issues, however, as a land-based power, Russia has always been limited in naval capacity because of the limited number of year-round blue water port that it's traditionally possessed. Murmansk and Archangel in Russia's northwest, located deep within the Arctic, are the home ports of their largest and most capable fleets, the Northern Fleet, which Russia is currently expanding while redefining the fleet's military importance. In a conflict with NATO, Russia's Northern Fleet would seek to cut the U.S. off from the European NATO allies by controlling the sea lines of communication between North America and Europe to divide and conquer. Due to geographical constraints in relation to the Northern Fleet, control of the ocean between Greenland, Iceland, United Kingdom, and Norwegian uh, gap exists called the Giuk uh, N gap, largely limits Russian naval activity in the North Atlantic. On the other hand, Russia can constrain NATO actions in the Arctic if they dominate the Geokin uh, gap. The crux of the problem for Russia is all about controlling sea lines of communication to deny U.S. intervention in Europe, effectively splitting NATO across the Atlantic. This is where Norway's geostrategic importance is discernible. Norway's location alongside the, uh, the Geokin gap is proximity to Russia and, importantly, Russia's northern fleet and the location of Svalbard a huge Norwegian archipelago located in the Arctic Ocean above Murmansk and Archangel. It combined com facilitates tacit NATO control over Russian movement in the Arctic Ocean and North Atlantic. Svalbard is approximately 400 miles north of continental Norway and 600 miles south of the North Pole. However, as previously stated, virtual presence is in fact actual absence. If NATO is not actively deterring in the Arctic, then we're not in the Arctic. Svalbard, while Norwegian, poses only a virtual threat to Russia and is more likely to be a fracture line in the Arctic for Russia to exploit. While the Svalbard archipelago is Norwegian by treaty, it simultaneously, by the same treaty, is free of any military forces, and it's completely open to economic interests of the 46 other treaty nations, including Russia. To this end, Russia maintains a relatively large population in Svalbard, where it can freely, by treaty, exploit Svalbard's resources. It's worthy of mention that China is also heavily engaged in Svalbard through the economic element of national power. Tromsog Fidmark, Norway's northeasternmost county, just by way of orientation, uh, the south uh, location where I currently live in Stavanger would be like, Nor would be like New Orleans. So Tromsog, Finmark, uh, Finmark County, Shirkinus up on the Russian border is like Boston. That's how long Norway is. Think New Orleans to Boston. And oh, by the way, that Russian border is further east than St. Petersburg, Russia. So Norway dog legs to the right, um, hooking quite far east, more east than people realize. And that, uh, that consists as a potential fracture line. As a location with relatively large Russian demographics, like 10 to 15 percent of the population, and where active Russian electronic warfare and influence operations are a common occurrence, a pattern of the environmental consideration Russia exploits exploited in 2014 with the Ukrainian Crimean Peninsula, it emerges. While Norway is a NATO nation and subsequently covered by NATO's Article 5 protections, direct Russian interve intervention is a highly unlikely in in endeavor. 
Russia's proclivity to sow discord within NATO and individual countries by indirect means should give Norway and the West pause. As the character of war changes over time with the refinement of gray and hybrid warfare strategies, this should, show, this should cause growing apprehension. Influence operations, a weapon Russia has already effectively wielded against democratic nations, driven by social media, have likely not reached their full potential in dominating human terrain. Indeed, influence operations today are likely only in an embryonic stage of development, but have demonstrated significant strategic capability. Well, right here and today, I, I won't attempt to answer if, where exactly, or where uh, Russia will make another land grab. It'd be dangerous and neglectful and uh, negligent to assume away a Russian desire or their capabilities to do so. These security concerns regarding Russia take as to why a NATO presence in Norway is a strategic initiative and imperative. So why are U.S. Marines there? Ultimately, that be imperative of the Arctic and NATO. As previously outlined, those imperatives are directly tied to ensuring competitive economic access to the Arctic amidst an environment that is relatively lacking in well-defined economic exclusion zones and security apparatuses to enforce laws and maintain order. Part of the task of maintaining a safe and secure environment in the Arctic has fallen with the U.S. and NATO, specifically for the U.S. with the Marines, by supporting deterrence operations in Norway. Following Russia's illegal invasion of Crimea in 2014, increased U.S. presence along the NATO's eastern borders was necessary to reassure our allies of the commitment to collective defense. While the reasons for establishing Murphy are multifaceted, American reassurance to NATO, and particularly Norway, was a key consideration. However, U.S. Marine Corps involvement in the Arctic and Norway will continue to take an ever-increasing importance. With the previously outlined climate issues and new capability like massive nuclear-powered icebreakers, the Arctic is becoming a blue water ocean for the first time in known history. So why Murphy? Why the Marines in the Arctic? The challenges outlined in this presentation by Russia and expanding tensions with China add up to the need for the U.S. and NATO to maintain a credible deterrence force in the region while, main, while facilitating peaceful economic competition. A core capability for ensuring deterrence means maintaining a credible, Arctic-capable, amphibious force. In the event of a conflict, these forward deployed units can act as a blunting force to counter enemy aggression while, divide, while providing time to allow follow-on echelons to arrive and bring in the fight to the enemy. As part of a broader DOD effort to increase uncertainty among America's adversaries and economize joint force assets, dynamic deployments to Norway have become the standard. Moreover, in conjunction with the already existing McPippin equipment set, Murphy makes Norway the premier template for enabling the Commandant's vision of the new Marine Corps warfighting concept outlined in Force Design 2030. Marines in Norway serve a deterrence role or potentially as a blunting force inside the WES, the Weapons Engagement Zone, as we talked about before with the Major General. As a part of the force design, new concepts and development could include U.S. Marines targeting ships with long-range shore-to-ship missiles, facilitating sea control and sea denial operations, as well as helping the U.S. Navy hunt enemy submarines, with Marines operating in a highly dispersed manner. These, these capabilities deter and dissuade in high north competition. These ideas would build on already developed concepts, including the EABO, DMO, L the LOKI, the littoral operations and con contested environments, among others, which together provide a basis for how the Marine Corps plans to operate in the next contingencies. What these con concepts add up to in a bluing Arctic environment are realistic options to impose hefty costs on ad adversaries seeking to exploit disorder to their advantage. Bottom line, the Marine Corps must be capable of projecting forces at sea, from the sea, and ashore, including in the bluing Arctic. Realistic training under Arctic conditions at the tactical level directly supports these strategic requirements. The Marine Corps learned its lesson in the Korean War about fighting in the cold after the chosen reservoir. Namely, long-term exposure to the effects of extreme cold weather conditions is the only way to build the requisite warfighting and survival skills needed to fight in that type of environment. From this perspective, as well as the others mentioned, Norway is a critical partner. The Marine Corps needs Norwegian expertise and infrastructure that the U.S. lacks in the region, including access to port facilities, airfields, and housing to improve our operational mobility 
for its warfighters while meeting the demands of sustaining the force. As Arctic ice caps continue to thaw and tensions grow between competitive states, demands for the Marine Corps expertise in cold weather operations are likely to continue growing. In conclusion, in the coming decades, a bluing Arctic will continue to grow with the importance as a result of the changing climate. This will create a geopolitical environment where the U.S. and its NATO allies cannot afford to cede the strategic initiative. Towards this end, cooperation with partners is essential in building synergy to confront regional threats while making the collective security burden lighter. Subsequently, a U.S. Marine Corps is needed that can truly operate in any clime or place, including Arctic conditions. Equally important, a Marine Corps is needed that can seamlessly integrate with its allies and partners to deter and defeat malign actors. The Marine Corps is a better warfighting organization because of its partnership with the Norwegian military, and that is something that every uniformed service member can appreciate. America's allies around the world help lighten the joint force load so that when the call comes, all forces can focus on the efforts on fighting and defeating any adversary. Moreover, America's allies bring critical capabilities that the U.S. cannot always replicate or do as well, often due to a lack of experience. The Norwegian Army and the critical capabilities they bring to the NATO alliance is just such a partner, with their constant presence and experience under Arctic conditions that U.S. Marines from Murphy personally draw on for the benefit of the United States and indeed for all nations with an interest in preserving a secure environment amidst the bluing Arctic. In short, the Marine Corps not only needs to be in Norway, it wants to be in Norway. And with that help, the, all the U.S. partners, the U.S. Marines are contributing now and bringing future capabilities that will, alongside our allies and partners, help guarantee open economic competition thrives in the bluing Arctic. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, I, so I believe we've got Brigadier uh, General Henderson, is that correct? Okay, gentlemen, let's do a comm check. Let's see if we're connected. Uh, do you hear me? I can hear you now. Technology is amazing. Let's uh, let's get this. Let me close the hatch. On. Thank you. So, see uh, what happened it was very simple. Uh, so, board in the corporate Marines, and um, and he does what a 22-year-old does. Like that. Hey, I have uh, some very simple comments. I'm gonna. Uh, try to uh, uh, close up with this panel here with a uh, strategic context and into a naval context. And hopefully then uh, we can move to Q&A. I see those uh, questions building up there in the chat room and uh, and would go from there. So hey, for strategic context, ladies and gentlemen, the United States has long maintained a forward postured force of floating ashore to reassure our friends, to deter the aggressors respond to crisis and maintain alliances and enforce international norms. For over 75 years, the Naval services have subscri subscribed to a paradigm of expeditionary operations to secure and assure peace and security of nations and its allies and partners. But our contemporary force structures and capabilities within this paradigm are built upon three assumptions. There's a presumptive readily achieved the assumption of sea control, air superiority, and assured communications. I say again, a presumption of sea control, air superiority, and assured communications. But our potential adversaries have recently acted to challenge these fundamental assumptions, thus weakening the foundation upon which the U.S. naval forces were built to contribute to the joint warfighting capability. Global competitions are fielding standoff engagement capabilities, long range systems designed to keep US forces out of key operating areas and push them farther away from our overseas allies and partners while minimizing the risk to their own force. The impending challenge is significant and it cannot be met by merely refining our current methods and capabilities. From that, if you take it to a naval context, United States Navy, the United States Marine Corps, and the United States Coast Guard collectively has the Naval Service perform the following four enduring functions. We ensure that the safe seaborne movement of friendly commerce and military forces. We influence events to include projecting military power overseas. 
we prevent an adversary seaborne movement of commerce and military forces that counter our ability as a nation to have the freedom of the seas for both ourselves and our partners and our allies. And finally, we prevent adversaries from influencing events to include the projection of their military power upon the US and our friendly ally shores. This is the opening context in the tentative manual for expeditionary advanced based operations on page one, tack two. It's nested inside the tri-service maritime strategy and should not be something new in our discussion here in 2021. The paradigm is shifting, not merely in capabilities of our adversaries to be able to deny those presumptions we had in the past of sea control, air superiority, assured communications. But the paradigm is also shifting greatly in the high north that provides potential maneuver space for various adversaries that we never had before. Whether that adversary comes from the north of uh, Russia or from the Pacific from China or any other potential uh, opportunistic adversary. You take this with our 30, Na uh, 30 NATO country partners and we look at how then we address this change in the paradigm and how we do it together. I think the brief provided by our great partner from Norway on the military integration is dramatically important. It starts at the tactical level and is being executed by 2MEF at the operational level and be, will be represented as it was in Trident Juncture several years ago in the future execution of coal response this spring. But is that enough to ensure that the Arctic remains peaceful and a stable region? from which there can be born the opportunities for capitalism, free market, and the state and the status of those international laws and norms that we have well prospered in, and envisioned by Secretary of State William Howard Seward. I say those are the things that will be challenged for us in the high north, and it's not just the uh, toughness of the condition, it's our ability to shift towards a maritime approach to a strategic context as I've previously described. And from that's how we see it in TUMEF, and that's how we are approaching it and working with our fleet partners, both US and coalition, as well as our international partners from land forces, such as the Norwegian Brigade. 